So let, let's get into this. Are we actually prepared? And if, in fact, we're not, what's going to happen here? Joining us to take a look, closer look at this, um, Dr. Kavita Patel, a primary care physician and a non-resident fellow at the Brookings Institution. She helped draft the Affordable Care Act. And Cheryl Peterson, vice president of nursing practice for the American Nurses Association. Um, Dr. Patel, I'm going to start with you on this one. Um, in his briefing this morning, New York Governor Andrew Cuomo was asked how many cases the state expected to see, and he made a pretty startling revelation. Take a listen to this. Google that question, and you will get a range from 40 percent to 80 percent of the population. Merkel said what, 70 percent? 60 percent of her population. 40% to 60%. So take 40% to 60% of 18 million. Take a hospitalization rate of our sample of about 17%. And then compare that to 50,000 hospital beds. Um, so that's pretty incredible. That is 50,000 hospital beds, Dr. Patel, uh, in New York. According to a 2018 survey by the American Hospital Association, um, there are just over 1 million hospital and intensive care beds um, in the United States total. If we see a huge spike in this thing, um, what could we expect with regards to our infrastructure at hospitals? Well, I, I mean, it would collapse and combine that with uh, President Trump's kind of proclaim on a call with governors today that, you know, we'll try to do our best, but basically you're on your own. I think Governor Cuomo is right, along with other governors, to realize that this is really not an option. And these closures, while I think it's such a jar to the American public, are the exact right thing to do. And, and keep the one good kind of silver lining mm. is that you've got very capable health care workers we have doctors who are literally across the country interacting with each other to learn from Italian doctors, South Korean doctors, Chinese doctors about how they are able to stand up an entire intensive care unit, you know, over a weekend. And so there are very smart people thinking about it, but there is no question that we do not have an infrastructure to support the needs. And a lot of it comes down to the, often the least expensive uh, supply, the masks, the cotton swabs, along with the most expensive supply, the people, to actually do all of this. Cheryl, give me a sense of what you are hearing from the front lines. As we well know, um, any of us have been in a situation, having been in a hospital, we know the nurses are on the front lines of this thing. What have you been hearing from your fellow nurses with regards to their experiences so far in dealing with the spread of the coronavirus? Yeah, thank you. Uh, nurses absolutely are on the front line, and they are delivering care on a daily basis. They're dealing with the day-to-day -day crisis. Is do we have a sufficient number of masks? Do we even have agreement between our federal agencies about what masks we need? How are we planning for this for the future? How are we going to sustain operations? And how and it's not adding more 12 hour shifts for nurses. But how do we look at how are we going to sustain the entire health care team? And we know there is good thinking going on and that needs to be communicated regularly and completely to our nurses so that they understand what's coming down the pike for them as they are delivering care. Are they not getting that type of communication at this point, Cheryl, from your understanding? From our understanding, it's still very spotty about what they know about how the hospital is planning to move forward. Um, I heard on social media from one of our members who was saying they just keep adding 12-hour shifts for us. Well, that's not going to be a sustainable practice. We really can and should do better. Um, Dr. Patel, let's talk about the ventilators or the lack thereof. There was this fear that in the hospitals they're going to be so inundated with patients and not enough ventilators in this country to take care of especially those immunocompromised and elderly patients. You have the president being reported in the New York Times today telling um, the state's governors you got to go after them and get them on your own. We will back you up, but go after them um, on your own as well. Is this enough, considering that ventilators with the coronavirus are basically what is saving people's lives? Well, it's, it's, it's certainly not enough. Today, we have about 110 to 120,000 ICU beds across the country. But the real limit to that is actually nurses and doctors and assistants to staff those beds 
So on any given day, we have about 60,000 kind of ventilator-supported beds across the country. Now, we do not have enough ventilators for the kind of numbers Gov Governor Cuomo was saying, but you've heard a lot of people, even on your show, talk about flattening the curve. That's why we're closing things down. If we're having to talk about having enough ventilators for everyone with an infection, we are not going to have any sort of system to support that. We will, however, if we can do something in the next 14 days, staying in our homes, avoiding unnecessary social contact, we are absolutely going to be able to see this through. And I do believe it'll be hard, but we will be able to work creatively to kind of to find the solutions. We do not want to do what Italy is doing, where they're having to make decisions, A or B, which patient is going to get the ventilator. And so we have to do everything now to prevent that step from happening. So, Cheryl, let, let's go there for a moment just so people can understand the scope of this thing and how important it is to um, abide by the rules that are being put in place um, for this cordoning off and isolation that so many people are taking now um, for these measures. What happens if we hit a point in which these hospitals are completely and totally overrun and inundated and they just don't have enough equipment to keep up with the number of immunocompromised and elderly patients that are coming to see them? Yeah, then we're really in a point where there has to be some real decisions that are made. And those are decisions that should not be made by frontline health care providers. Those are really decisions that must be made at a systems level and that they should be based on transparency, ethics, equity, that it has to be proportional. There are real guidance out there through uh, the National Institutes of Medicine and other places where, in fact, we've thought about what do you need to do when you have to alter the standard of care. And, and it really does have to reside at a systems level where those decisions are being made. And quite frankly, we're, we're as Kavita has said, we are not there yet. Mm -hmm. However, what we really need to be doing is talking across systems in, within our communities, at our state and national level, so that we really know where are the resources that can and should be used, and how are we making sure that those are being appropriately and fully utilized um, so that we're not letting anything go to waste. And that's about communication. All right, Dr. Patel, Cheryl Peterson as well, thank you to you both.